Voyaging of Rouen, Abridged, Episode 8 What is south of here? Oscar asked, taking the telescope and training it in that direction. Nothing particularly, Horace said. A lot of rocky coast and the same north, really. What, no other structures at all? Horace adjusted his monocle and thought. Well, there's an old industrial port south of Rouen, but it's much farther around the coast and you can't see it from here. And the only structure to the north is the castle of Rouen. When he mentioned the place, Oscar's fur stood on end. Does any animal live there? In the castle? No, not for centuries. How can you be sure? Horace smiled. The castle is impregnable, Oscar. It has been deserted ever since I have known of it, and I am old. Though I understand that scholars believe there was a ridge of stair or stone scaffolding that wound up its pedestal once upon a time. But it crumbled centuries ago, and it's now quite impossible to reach. Well, I find that very hard to believe, Oscar said. A castle like that would be a challenge for any animal keen on mountain climbing, at the very least. Or access from the air by one of Rouen's wealthy retirees. How can you be certain it's never been done? Because the ruling council would never allow it. Oscar looked like an advert for static electricity. We need to find out where that barge is going, he said. His two friends nodded. Back in the attic, Horace found a small collapsible telescope, which Oscar furtively placed in his collapsible tummy. Horace noticed. A collapsible tummy! he exclaimed, pointing at it. Yes, admitted Oscar. I knew there was something special about you, the dog insisted, waggling a paw at him. He the velvet paw of Asquith, the dervy said showering Horace in spittle from yet another word with lisps at both ends. The dog beamed at such revelation before wiping his face discreetly. Encouraged, Oscar said, I need a car, Horace, ideally a fast one. Then you shall have one, the dog said, turning to lead them back downstairs. Determined not to be left out, the dervy called after him, Can I take something too? Of course, my dear. Horace called up from stairs he and Oscar were already halfway down. Take whatever you might require. Searching through clutter, she took a dividing compass, a pair of pliers and a torch. Hearing Horace and Oscar thump downstairs, Bremble asked what on earth was going on. But before her husband could reply, there was a clattering from upstairs and the dervy tumbled past them and came to a halt beside Bremble. While she helped her up, the dervy apologised blaming such acrobatics on having one hind paw currently heavier than the other. The four hurried down the hallway and out the front door, and Horace led them around the house to a garage. Inside, he flicked on a light before pulling a dust sheet from something large in the middle of it. The dervy gasped, as did Oscar, though knowing less about cars wasn't sure why. Before them stood a splendid green 1345 Muppet Finn ZR two-seater with twin perplex Zirkov shaders. This, Horace said, is my pride and joy, after my Bremble, of course, but I am far too old to drive it now, and it has been sitting here for nearly ten years. He traced a fluffy paw lovingly along its lines. You... Oscar T. Bagduvin are welcome to use it to sort out this mess. I ask only that you treat it with the same respect as I did in my younger days. Oscar stared at the thing. Horace, honestly, this is not at all necessary, he said. The one you gave me a lift in yesterday would be fine, really. That won't do more than 30 speed, Horace said. This 1345 on the other paw... We'll do 230 speed. The dervy was already all over it, admiring its shape from various angles. Will it start? Bremble asked. Horace lifted a side panel. While the dervy offered advice, he fiddled within it. After a moment, he returned to Oscar and offered him a key. Try it, he said. Oscar took it. For the sake of Rouen, then. The dog nodded. For all our sakes. Ten minutes later, 
With the derby strapped in beside him, Oscar screamed the Muppet Fin ZR down the tight curves of the headland's exclusive residential streets. With teeth gritted, he was determined to get the thing heading south before losing sight of the barge. The Dervy had insisted on accompanying him, and despite the arduous circumstance, Oscar agreed. After all, she knew Rouen far better than he. The car's tyres tore at bitumen when Oscar barrelled the car around as many bends as possible without spreading them liberally across roadway. This wasn't easy, it being only the second time he'd been behind the wheel. Lack of traffic made things easier, however, as did the lack of pedestrians. When reaching the bottom of Rouen's headland, he took a final corner with a bounce that had the derby square sideways. In a scream of tyres, the car leapt onto a main road, and Oscar stabbed his paw at the floor to unleash the engine's impatience, leaving the night caked in dust and pebbles and burnt red by taillights. Heading south upon the coastal road, Oscar settled them into just under 200 speed, which the car seemed to appreciate. The road soon edged closer to cliffs, and when they barreled over hills, the Dervy watched for the Black Sea to appear between them. How far to the industrial port? Oscar asked, his paws gripping the wheel as the needle nudged 200 speed. She looked at his dials. At this rate, 15 minutes. Do you think that's where it's headed? Oscar spurred the car on a little more. Apparently it's the only place it can be headed. They shot along the road, with their wake screaming red and their headlights opening up the straight ahead, both slicing the dark like a green scalpel through blackest hide. There! the derby cried, pointing. Down there! In a final scream of tyre and gravel, Oscar slid to a stop upon a crest of hill, inadvertently leaving them to face the way they'd just come. It's down there, the derby said. He killed the engine and lights and got out. It was cold and he wished he'd kept the coat Horace provided. The derby limped from the car. There, she hissed, thee, the port. At the bottom of the hill lay a small bay with a length of darkness spearing into the sea. It appeared abandoned, as black as shadow and easily missed in the dark. Can you see the barge? she asked, looking across the sea. Retrieving the telescope from his collapsible tummy, Oscar trained it on black shapes below. There doesn't appear to be much down there at all, he said, but then recognised the same shape spied earlier. Goodness, I was right, the barge is there, it's already berthed. Show me, she said, taking the telescope and looking for herself. They must be unloading something. Oscar said. The Dervy looked at him. Do you think they're real smugglers? Oscar shrugged. I don't know the Dervy, but there's one way to find out. He hoped she might volunteer to climb down and have a look herself, but she didn't and instead waited expectantly. Wait for me here, he said with a sigh. I shan't be long. Creeping over the crest of hill, he slunk through grass. And what if you are? She called after him, worried. He raised his head. Then return to Rouen and tell the police, he said, before rethinking the idea. No, better not, perhaps tell Horace. Though he didn't think that would achieve much either. Oh, I don't know, just come and get me. The dervy swallowed and nodded as he slunk back into grass. At the bottom of the hill, Oscar crept toward outlying buildings. He darted across an expanse of ground and took refuge against a wall. He tried recalling some covert night manoeuvre training, but couldn't, having had a tendency to compose images verse rather than listen to the screams of his instructors. Nevertheless, he did recall its fundamental rule. After all, he'd had to write it out several hundred times for not listening. Don't get caught. Don't get caught. Don't get... But he froze then, mid-mantra. Across the way, parked against a crumbling wall, was a black saloon with red plates. It glinted in the night, more out of place against the dilapidated warehouses than petrol in a bakery. He crept toward it, wondering whether he should stop it leaving. If he shoved some dirt into the distributor thing, he might be able to buy them some time. 
which seemed prudent considering Horace's certainty Ruen was running out of the stuff. There was a noise then, a clattering, pebbles rolling down a roof. His breath caught and then tore. He glanced around wildly but could see nothing other than derelict buildings and a great deal of abandonment. But something felt wrong and he was again keen to flee back up the hill and insist Horace and the Dervies sort all this out for themselves while he packed his bags, threw a key at Percival and took the next flight home. He'd done his bit. It was up to them to do theirs. He slunk back, hoping it was no more than the sound of industrial decay. The barge was here, and the car proved a link to the ruling council. It was enough to help fathom their next move. But Oscar didn't realise his next move was already decided. When gravel again rolled across a roof, he remained distracted enough for a cat to club him across the back of the head and send him to a land of dreams, a land that might be a welcome reprieve from the nightmare just beginning. The first thing he noticed was his missing pantaloons. The second thing he noticed was that they were on his head. The third thing he wondered was how they'd got there, while his fourth realisation was he couldn't remove them when he tried. His paws were tied, together, with the rest of him secured to a chair, and his head hurt as though he'd been hit with a brick. The room was large. It reminded him of the lair, and Oscar wondered if that's where he was, though it was unlikely, principally because he was tied to a chair with pantaloons on his head. He blinked and looked around. It didn't seem the sort of place one might expect for an interrogation, which was the fifth thing he had a bit of a mull over. It was a large terracotta room with an enormous window along one wall. Dawn flooded everything, its light hurting his head only marginally less than bricks clubbing it. He winced, struggling with a headache so large it required scaffolding. There was a coffee table by the window, upon which was a bottle and a glass. Beside it was a tall, comfortable chair, and in it an animal stirred. It rose picked up the bottle and poured its contents into the glass. With the glass in pour, the cat pondered Oscar for a time, before drinking deliberately. After a refreshed sigh, it returned to the chair, put the glass down and sat. Who are you? It asked in a velvety purr. Oscar blinked. The cat oozed a confidence he had little of, especially when trussed up like a turkey with pantaloons on his head. Convinced his reply would be little more than a mew of angst, he refused to answer. The cat stood again, approached, and bent close. With a purr warning against playing games, it asked the question a second time, leaving Oscar to wilt beneath the cat's magnificent emerald eyes. Sedovitz returned to his chair, but did not sit. Do you know why you wear pantaloons on your head? he asked, staring out the window. Oscar said nothing. Because you are quite hideously ugly. The words winded and Oscar doubled over in shame. I despise inadequacy, said of it said, and I detest incompetence, which leaves our meeting most unfortunate, considering the degree to which you are both. Sedovitz peered at him, as one might do to a spilt cup of sick on the floor. Interestingly, I am left wondering how an animal as incompetent and ugly as you might manage to remain upright. Frankly, your appearance makes a mockery of my breed. His bottom lip quivering, Oscar remained stoic. I shall ask you again, and you shall answer me, unless you wish me to lose my temper and you do not want me to lose my temper. Despite his predicament, Oscar's resentment flared. This cat was not only responsible for the second autumn, but had rendered the dervy as a scapegoat. He pulled at the restraints, fuming at the animal's arrogance and wondering how volatile the cat's vanity was. And why is that, said of its tap and new? Oscar growled. Are you worried you might not find it again? Does that ridiculous eye patch of yours make it hard to see properly? Sedovitz's eyes flashed in a blaze of green. Oscar stared back. 
determined to topple the conceited creature from the pedestal he clearly claimed appropriate. Mm -hmm.